directed ourselves starting in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 is where we'll begin and we'll, we'll move to uh, another portion of Scripture where we'll spend most of our time today. But we're, we're starting in Luke chapter 4. As we started moving toward the uh, Christmas season, I, I've been praying, God, God, what do I do? Where, where, do uh, where do I park for the next few weeks? And God made it abundantly clear. These words, make much of Jesus. Make much of Jesus. Why would I make much of Jesus? Well, that seems like a no-brainer, right? For what well, you think that pastors of Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches would make much of Jesus, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, there are a lot of churches making much of programs, a lot of churches making much of uh, the personalities and all kinds of different things. But during this Christmas season and these holidays, how much of it is truly about Jesus? Let's be honest. How much of it is truly about Jesus? I can guarantee when y'all sat around the table on uh, Thursday, the percentage that was about Jesus, not that we purposely set out to be this way, but there was a whole heavy percentage on the turkey and the dressing or stuffing or whatever you want to call it, cranberry sauce or whatever you eat. There was a heavy uh, emphasis on the right setting because some of you are formal and you have to have the right forks and the right knives and the right plates and such. As you can tell, I I'm not that kind of guy. I'm just... Break out the paper, darling, and let's eat. But truthfully, during this season, we have focused so little, and we're getting ready to go into the most commercialized time of all. So we as the church need to be driving the message of Jesus home more than we ever have. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 16. It says, so Jesus came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So far, everything sounds good, right? And he was handed the, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and a recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now so far, for those of us who have grown up in, in churches, uh, especially those who you know have a uh, formal uh, order of service where you have a specific person designed to read the scriptures, this seems all right. It goes on to say in verse 20, then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, now just imagine if somebody who had been in this church for years came back into town, came up, read the scripture and said pretty much everything you heard about, that's me. Y'all were thinking, what's he smoking? What is wrong with this guy? Surely he is a false prophet. And, of course, they're thinking out, you know, they're thinking and saying, isn't this Joseph's son? This is the carpenter's boy. And then Jesus says a whole bunch of stuff. And I don't, I don't want to get into all the intricacies of this passage. But it says in verse 28, So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, because Jesus pretty much told them like it was in verses 23 through 27. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city, 
and they led him to the brow of the hill on uh, which their city was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. That's the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. I am so glad that when I came here in May of last year and I preached my first sermon from Colossians chapter 3 that uh, instead of having the meal after the church, y'all decided to have Rose Preacher and take me to a cliff and get, get, try to kill me. Thank God that didn't happen. And, and praise God, we're, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, year, year and a half in, and y'all have been, uh, y'all continue to be very gracious. Thank you. Praise God. But unfortunately, it's not always the case. But anyway, Isaiah 61 is where we are for the rest of the message. Isaiah 61, if you go ahead and turn there. This morning, I'm going to preach to you a message. And the reason I didn't go into Luke 4 is because there's a part of the message that is not included in Jesus' uh, recollection uh, or a reiteration of what Isaiah prophesied. So Isaiah chapter 61, and I want to look at the subject, why Jesus came. Why Jesus came. Let's go back. You've, you've already heard uh, a few of these verses. Isaiah, a few thousand years before Jesus is on the scene, prophesies this about Christ. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Notice it says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. In other words, Jesus' ministry was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And empowered by the Spirit, Jesus came, number one, to heal the damage that sin brings. So if you're a note taker, that's number one. To heal the damage that sin brings. If you're engaged in sin right now, you're probably thinking, oh, what damage is it doing? I'm having a good time. I'm enjoying myself. I'm doing what I like to do. Surely there's no damage, and the the devil would love for you to stay blind to it, truthfully. Anytime I've ever engaged in anything outside the will of God, I have fooled myself into thinking there's no way that it could harm myself or anybody else. But sin brings damage, and we're going to look at all the ways that it brings damage today and and why Jesus came, first of all, to heal the damage that sin brings. But I want you to notice another thing, that Jesus came to minister to messy people. Starting in verse 1, he, he goes through a list of messy people. He talks about the poor, he talks about the brokenhearted, the captives, those who are bound. And the truth is, and I know this might offend somebody, somebody who's watching by Facebook or maybe somebody in the room. I hate to break it to us, including me, but we're all messy people. We are all messy people. And if you won't admit it, I guarantee somebody in your family will. Your spouse will admit it. Your children or your parents or your brothers or your sisters, somebody is going to admit how messy you are. We're all messy people. And it's easy for us who are sitting in a church building today to say, I'm not messy. I am sitting in the house of God. On Sunday morning where I'm supposed to be. And I look around and I can tell you who's not here. You you might be what you think is a sanctified mess. But you're still a mess. We're all messy people. And just because your mess might be less messy than somebody else's. Mess is mess. Plain and simple. We're all messy people. But praise God in Christ, we are forgiven people. We are righteous people. 
But we still fight the flesh, don't we? Let's, let's go through that list. Because sin impoverishes, Jesus said, or well, he said in Luke 4, uh, Luke 4, but Isaiah prophesied that Jesus came to preach good tidings to the poor. Sin will leave you, as one songwriter said, broke, busted, disgusted, and they just can't be trusted. And some of y'all might remember the song. It's, it's, it goes back several years, actually before my time. Sin leaves you with a deficit. It impoverishes. Because sin breaks hearts. It breaks your heart when you're engaged in it. It breaks the heart of those that your sin affects. You think my sin doesn't affect anybody. I wish I could say that that were the case every time I counsel with people. Most of the time they come to me because somebody's sin has broken their heart. Because sin breaks hearts, uh, Jesus has come to heal the brokenhearted. And the truth is that somebody in, in this room or listening today, you're brokenhearted. Maybe you're brokenhearted because your kids have broken your heart. You tried to raise them in the ways of God and they have gone a different direction and you are just beside yourself. You're trying to hold on to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. And you're thinking, when am I going to see that come to pass? You're thinking, I've been a faithful steward in my finances. I haven't wasted money. I've given to the Lord. I have done all these things. But I'm still broke. I listened to this TV preacher one time that told me if I laid hands on my wallet and spoke blessings over it, that I'd have thousands in my wallet. Why isn't it there? We're brokenhearted over all kinds of things, and some of those are because we believe lies. And we have expectations and people and things, and even God has not met our expectations. Because sin breaks hearts, He will heal the brokenhearted, but... Because sin makes captives. I don't know anybody. I know people who think that sin gives them freedom. It's so funny how when people graduate from high school, they think, oh, I'm going to have freedom. I'm going to get out of the house. I'm going to go in the military and do what I want to do. How many of you went in the military and got to do what you wanted to do? Anybody anybody in here? (laughs) I can tell. (laughs) Some of you military spouses or those who've been in the military, you can say, no, I didn't get to do what I wanted to do. People think that freedom is found in doing what they want to do. No, freedom is the liberty, the power to do what you ought to do. And there is great joy in that, despite what the devil would want you to think. Sin makes captives. Scripture says, uh, the Apostle Paul said in Romans, we're slaves to sin. Sin does not have free people. It has enslaved people in bondage, dying to get out. Because sin makes captives, he will proclaim liberty to the captives. The Scripture says in verse 1. And the opening of the prison to those who... Who are bound. If you're looking for true freedom today, it's only in Christ Jesus. There is no other source, no other place. Jesus came to heal the damage that sin brings. He came to minister to messy people. But then I want you to notice also, He came to warn of impending judgment. It says in verse 2, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Because sin is a crime that needs to be avenged, Jesus will proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. This is not the kind of preaching that will make people shout. This is not the kind of of preaching that will make people walk out with big giant smiles on their faces thinking that God does deal justly with sin. But the scripture says it and I cannot veer away from it. 
But the, but the beautiful thing about it is Jesus over and over again warns that we are going to deal with judgment. We're going to, uh, and, and he gives us, if you look at the history of the Israelite people, he gave them chance after chance after chance after chance. If God is not a God of patience, I don't know who he, what he is. Who he is. God has been patient with you and he's been patient with me over and over and over again. Aren't you thankful this morning? Aren't you thankful that he's not a strike one, you're out kind of God? He has given us time and time and time again to get in line with him. And he gives that warning. But then notice a fourth thing. Jesus came to provide comfort. Because sin brings grief, Scripture says at the end of verse 2, He will comfort all who mourn to console those who mourn in Zion. And notice verse 3 goes on to say, He will give beauty instead of ashes. Some of us have been through some pretty traumatic experiences in our lives, and the truth is our life, when all was said and done, was just a pile of ashes. And some of us were sitting in the middle of the ashes, hoping for a better day. But Jesus says, I'll give you beauty instead of ashes. I'll give you the oil of joy instead of mourning. Some of you are, are still broken hearted today, and he wants to exchange that mourning for joy. But here's one that I, I love this phrase. He will give you the garment of praise to replace the spirit of heaviness. I love that scripture refers to praise as a garment. And I want to throw out the question, what kind of garment are we wearing? Are we wearing praise as a garment? Is it something that people notice about us because we exude a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving? Or are we just rotten and people dread when we walk in the room? I know I've, I've shared this wall sign before. Every person alive brings somebody joy. Someone they walk into the room and someone they walk out. We need to be the kind of people... Who bring people joy when we walk into the room. And they're sad to see us go. We need to be people who wear the garment of praise. I remember uh, several years ago when I was on staff uh, at a church in Seneca. We invited this lady. And I have to confess. I, my, I was totally wrong about this lady when I met her. I heard her sing for the first time at home with a heart. And that night we had heard all kinds of singing. And I can't say that it was all good. So after hearing some singing, this very feeble lady begins to walk up the stage. And I mean heels about that thick. You're talking about a lady in her late 70s, but... Anytime she went to a service of worship, she was wearing those heels. And I thought, this lady's struggling to get up onto the stage. There ain't no way she's going to sing. Probably going to let out a little squeak for Jesus. I mean, I, I was, I, I'm, just, I'm just being honest with you. And <laughs> she opened her mouth and filled the room with the praises of God. And I said, Lord, I was wrong. And she sang about three or four songs that, that night. And the glory of God filled the house. And I was like, Lord, I really was wrong. I went back to staff meeting. And we were uh, preparing for an upcoming uh, those four nights of revival emphasis. And so I, I, I said to the pastor, I said, this lady that I heard at home with a heart, can we have her come sing? He said, absolutely. So we scheduled her for that Tuesday night, and I mean, she, she didn't disappoint. Once again, she came in with her nine-inch heels, or whatever they were, and, and uh, she 
with the help of two of our men, ascended uh, those steps to the uh, top of the platform, and she, uh, she sang. It drove the sound man crazy because she didn't want to hold a microphone, but her voice could fill the room. And this was what was said after, after the service that night. She said, uh, the pastor says, that is the kind of lady who carries praise with her everywhere she goes. That's the kind of uh, reputation we need to have, that we carry praise wherever we go. But then notice that Jesus has come to give stability. Look at what the last part of uh, verse 3 says. That they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Why? That He may be glorified. Not so somebody else, uh, not, not so that the person can be glorified. There's a whole lot of self-glorification going on today. But it says the planting of the Lord so that the Lord will be glorified. Here is the beautiful thing about salvation. You and I cannot get the glory from it. That doesn't matter how dirty we used to be. It doesn't matter how much God cleaned us up. We cannot get the glory from salvation. And I love it. We can be the finest Christian who dots all the I's and crosses all the T's and all these glorious things. But at the end of the day, he gets the glory. Not me. Not the finest preacher in the world. God gets the glory. But then this last thing. Jesus came to turn messy people into ministers. You're like, hmm, I don't know about that, brother. I'm fine warming up a seat here at Oasis Church, but minister, no, 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 no. Let's look at the scripture, verse 4. It says, they, notice the shift changes. The, the word they starts being used here in, at the end of verse 3, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And what shall these people do who have been changed by the power of Jesus? They shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. The people of God are going to be the ones to do the rebuilding, to do the raising, to do the repairing. You and I have been given a ministry of reconciliation. Let's look at a couple of verses as we close. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. This came alive to me at a very dark time in my life. And I, I was asking God, why are you letting me go through this? And within days, he gave me this scripture. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation. Why? So we can sit around and enjoy the comfort and say, Thank you, Jesus, and take a nice long nap. No. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. When God comforts you, when God comforts me, I am not to waste it. I am called to give that comfort to other people. There are certain things that I've been through. I can take comfort that God has given me and I can help comfort other people there are things that I haven't been through that you have been through you can take that comfort that God has given you and you can have a ministry to other people does it have to be formal do you have to run it through the church no so it may happen in the grocery store it may happen at the gas pump it may happen well, you're at the bowling alley. I don't know, but God will place people in your path 
that you can take the comfort God has given you and you can pass it on to somebody else that needs it. That's the beautiful thing about it. You know, often people will come to me and I have to tell them I have not been through a particular experience. And I have to tell them I can only tell you in theory. And sometimes I'll refer them to people who have been through that same experience. I'll contact somebody I know and say, would you mind talking to somebody I know about this? But I want to go a step further. 2 Corinthians 5. We love verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Probably one of our favorite verses to quote. But in its full context, there is so much more to that. Because you and I have become new creations, here's what happens. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. So God has reconciled us because prior to salvation, we were at enmity with God, Scripture says. But notice this, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You and I are called to help reconcile people to the Father. Scripture goes on to say, He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. My plea this morning to anyone who does not know Christ as Savior, be reconciled to God. Over and over again, I may sound like a broken record. But I will not quit with this message because God's called me to it. And I will not take for granted that everybody that comes into this room or that watches our Facebook ministry is reconciled to God. I'm not going to take that for granted. There have been people who have been sitting under the sound of the gospel for years, sometimes even decades, before they ever come to faith in Christ. So I want to conclude with a couple of questions. Number one, are you a mess or a minister? Are you a mess or a minister? Some of you right now, if you were to admit it, say, Matthew, I'm a mess. This stuff about ministers of reconciliation, I'll add, mm, I'm a mess, I'm not a minister. Are you sitting in a heap of the ashes of your life, bemoaning everything that did or didn't happen to you? Or are you using the junk of your life as a platform to share Jesus? I'm going to read that again. I think it's, it bears reading a second time. Are you sitting in a heap of the ashes of your life, bemoaning everything that did or didn't happen to you, what you thought that should have happened, the, the fairy tale ending that you were begging God for? Are you sitting in the ashes of reality? Or are you using the junk of your life as a platform to share Jesus? All the junk that's happened in my life, and I, I haven't had the worst life. I've been pretty blessed. A few bumps in the road. But the bumps that I've had, I use them as an opportunity to share Jesus. I would not be standing here today if it were not for Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus came to minister to messy people. To heal the damage that sin brings. To warn of impending judgment. To provide comfort. And to turn messy people into ministers. Has Jesus changed your life?
we're going to invite you. We're just, no music today, but if you need to come pray, maybe you need to give your heart to Christ, realizing that you're a sinner. Nothing that you can do can satisfy God's righteous demands. But to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. To God, I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again for me. Today I received his free gift of salvation. I turn from my sin and I turn to Christ. Maybe today that's what you, you need to do. Whatever God's saying in this moment, I just want to say, do business with Him. And if you, if you don't feel comfortable doing it in this service, don't leave here thinking, oh, I've got time. Because none of us are guaranteed another moment. Father, I'm so thankful that Jesus came. We could have been left in a mess. But you loved us too much to leave us in the mess. So you sent your son. Scripture says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You didn't, you didn't come here to condemn us. We were condemned already. We had a death sentence because of sin. But thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes away all sin. God, I pray. Whatever you're speaking into the hearts of those who are in this room and those watching. Accomplish your purpose. Transform lives. And we'll give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, well, we're going to come off Facebook. we got a few.